So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. This is the TEEP or Trusted Execution and Environment Provisioning Working Group. Um, so if you were not expecting to be in the TEEP call, you can drop. Um, so I've got my co-chair, Tiru, on with me. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. This is a virtual intern meeting. The note well applies with respect to the policies and procedures. I think list everyone on the call um, has been in TEEP sessions before, so I will just leave it here and move forward. So for the agenda bashing, um, Jim has helped me get started with the etherpad, which I've noted here, but I could really use another note taker. Can I have a volunteer, please? We cannot move forward until we do. Anyone? Soren? Please. But your co-chair. Hiru? Hey, I can take the notes. No problem. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, so with that, we needed to bash the agenda here. I didn't have anybody, um, anybody meaning the authors of the T protocol volunteer to provide an update on that. Um, Actually, I sent you an email um, that I would like to discuss the issues and the PRs. When did you do that? Um, today or well, yesterday? Okay. <laughs> I probably it's missed done. it. No problem. I added it to the ESA path, the link also to the PRs. Okay, good. So, um, since I'm using the Acrobat, I will update it later. Um, but Hannes, thank you. And we'll use whatever time we have left. So if you're okay, since I didn't have this at the time that I was posting this, so you must have sent it after three or four in the afternoon, my time. Um, but anyway, so from the agenda, I moved it since I didn't know that you would be presenting, I moved you last. Is that okay? Or do you want me to move it back up and have the hackathon go last? Um, I, I think we will manage to go through all these items. I think we have enough time. So, okay. Well, I left it last just in case anyway. And so you can have the rest of the time um, since you'll be the last presenter. So anything else with respect to the agenda? If not, we can go ahead and get started. And um, Dave, I had you go first um, with the architecture. Okay, do you want me to project or do you have slides? Nope, I have them. Okay, great. You are ready. Okay, can you go into the full screen? I can't. I okay. figured out how to have Acrobat go full screen. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, I'm talking about draft 08. Next slide. You guys can hear me okay? Audio is doing fine? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so our timeline, we had a interim meeting, if you remember, about two months ago. Um, right before that, draft 06 was posted. And February and the interim meeting, we had a number of discussions, then a little bit of follow-up on the list. Um, the, which was about how do we resolve the working group last call comments. And so uh, we resolved the remaining, one, remaining ones in draft 07 in uh, March, taking into account the feedback from the virtual interim meeting. And since then, there have been no list discussion, but there have been two new issues filed since uh, draft 07. So keep going. Previously, um, at the interim meeting, this was our proposed timeline. This is the same slide as from February interim meeting. This is not the current next steps, right? Um, we, the plan was to post 07 before March 9th, which we did. And then the point is uh, we agreed to do a second working group last call um, to be discussed at IETF 107, which of course didn't happen. And so we're at approximately that point in this timeline. Okay, 
So remember, our original goal was to progress the architecture document to .esg for publication by the end of April. And depending on how this goes, we may still be on track because we could have a second group working group last call after this call. So go ahead. All right, so I'm gonna walk through the issues that have been filed um, since 07. So the first one was feedback that came in uh, from the Confidential Computing Consortium. Uh, if you remember at last face-to-face -face IATF, I gave a short slide deck on the introduction of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which uh, is a body that hosts open source projects that are relevant to TEEs. And uh, there was a piece of feedback that came in from them. And by the way, full disclosure, I am the chair of the Technical Advisory Council and the Confidential Computing Consortium. So part of my role is to provide feedback from the Confidential Computing Consortium to other technical bodies like you guys. So this was uh, me as the messenger providing that feedback from that other body. And so uh, this had to do with the definition of a TEE. So you can see in draft 07 to draft 08, there was a change made in two places in the document, the abstract and the introduction, which had the same text. Uh, about what the definition of a TEE was. And you can see this notion that only authorized code can execute within that environment was changed to any code within that environment can be tampered with. Um, and uh, the main point was this, the, the draft 08, it's really about code integrity rather than allowing or disallowing code. If you think about how something like SGX works, right? You can run a bunch of different things, but they're isolated from each other and they're not tamperable. But whether you prevent execution or not is not really core to the point of there being a TEE. The point is that you can't tamper with the code. And so uh, we made that change to align it with uh, their recommendations because uh, the editors you know, also agree. So unless there's any comments, we can go on to the next slide, just explaining uh, what the change was and why. So next one. And the other one, um, so this is, um, one of our um, AIST colleagues um, who often participates in, you know, AIST per folks participate in, hack in our hackathons and so on, had asked, you know, why does the TEAT protocol need to support devices with no REE? Uh, now, uh, if you may remember uh, issue number 139, I mean, you may remember that we discussed the similar thing recently in TEAT, um, sometime around the time of the last face-to-face -face at 106. And then it was I, uh, then it was 139, which was this contradiction about whether the device has to have an REE to use TEEP or not. And there was different places in the document that said one versus the other. There was a contradiction. In the February interim meeting, we then resolved that with an agreed resolution that it should be supported. Uh, but the uh, uh, Kuniyasu had asked, so I can't figure it out. When would that actually happen? And so the resolution was to add an example. And so that's the text in bold that appeared in draft 07, right? Example is a microcontroller, blah, blah, blah. If there's any comments, we can go on to the next slide. It's probably- Two issues. Um, nope, this two issues nice, that were filed um, since 07. Go ahead. Um, I, I think the, maybe maybe the, the wording isn't uh, ideal, um, but I think the issue uh, the case is like um, while we have sort of focused on the case where we have the broker and it resides um, sort of like we have to split between the broker and the RE and the, and the client side in the DE. Um, but of course, it, you could um, not have the broker and it, it basically resides inside uh, the trusted execution environment as well. Um, I think that would be another possibility. But I think uh, I think the text is is good. Thank you. Any other comments? And next slide. Uh, okay. So uh, this is another issue that was filed recently. And so this was uh, Nikolai uh, pointed out an omission that uh, we had added a bunch of text about the security model and the trust model and the privacy issues and so on. Um, and it covered DOS in some cases, but it did not mention that the broker or the rich execution environment or you know, whatever could do DOS by dropping messages in between the uh, TEAP agent and the TAM. Okay? And so uh, that was just, th that was never mentioned. It covered lots of other cases, but this case was not actually mentioned. And so the text in bold was added into two sections uh, to do that. 
So in 9.1, which is the overall you know, broker trust model, where it talks about uh, what the broker can and can't do and what, it's, what it still can do because it's not trusted, right? That's the whole point of the REE. Uh, the cheap broker can still conduct DOS attacks as discussed in 9.3, right? 9.3 is the one that covered different types of attacks. So forward reference there. And then uh, in 9.3, you can see in the middle there, the compromised RE may terminate the cheap broker, such that the cheap transactions cannot reach the TE, or might drop or delay messages between a TAM and a TEAP agent. Okay. So that was the uh, knob that says, yep, that's another one in the list. And then uh, the discussion after that is the same across the set of DOS attacks. So that was in draft 08. So before the ones were in draft 07, now we're into the ones that were addressed in draft 08. So keep going. Unless there's any comments. Okay. One of the topics that came up for the, well, roughly for the first time at the February interim meeting was how often the uh, TAM or the attestation service should be checked, right? So what's the, frequency, how long are uh, results valid, and so on. So we had this long discussion, which you can find in the minutes and the, uh, you know, can find notes about in the February interim minute, minutes. And so uh, the bottom two lines here are on the slide are the snippet from those actual uh, minutes in the etherpad, right? Um, which was the outcome of that discussion was that we should file an issue in the RATS architecture document about how long an attestation results would be used. And uh, Hank had pointed out during the interim here that we should, you know, talk about that there was always be some delay, and the evidence may have changed during the evaluation, right? There's there's no way around that, but we should point that out. But it's a dual issue between the TEEP architecture and the RATS architecture document, and so we need to coordinate between those two. And so uh, let's continue on because this is slide one of three on this topic. So, by the way, Ming took the action item, thank you, Ming, of actually filing the issue as a result of the interim meeting. So, what the issue 148 is, is it was uh, Ming posting it after the meeting, that, that the discussion. All right. So, the draft 07 partly addressed this. I mean, it had the first half of stuff. Okay. The first half of stuff is the part that coordinated with the RETS um, architecture. So the section in question here talks about malicious TAs, right? Because the whole topic was what happens when you're you know, out of compliance, something is bad, whether it's malicious or uh, policy has changed or whatever. And so uh, for the malicious case, you want to minimize how long you can be malicious for. And so the text in bold was added there, uh, which talked about there's some, this is summarizing the point that Hank and others had made in the interim meeting, right? There is, uh, an, there is, however, a time window during which a malicious TA might be able to operate successfully, which is the validity time of the previous attestation result. For example, if the verifier in figure five is updated to treat a previously valid TA as no longer trustworthy, any attestation result that previously generated saying that the TEA is valid will continue to be used until the attestation result expires. As such, the TAMS verifier should take into account the acceptable time window when generating attestation results. The RATS architecture for further discussion. So the point is the generic discussion should be in the RATS architecture document. And the text here in bold is the TEEP you know, how it applies to TEEP, right? What the, what the mapping is uh, between, uh, you know, TAs and TAMS and so on, and the generic uh, discussion in the RATS architecture. This is the first half because this only talked about how the how long the validity was and how how long the window lasted of vulnerability. Okay, and so you can see a pointer to the RATS architecture document issue that tracks the same issue on the RATS side. Right. Next slide. So that was draft 07, which solved half of the issue. We think um, the other half was in draft 08. So uh, Ming had pointed out um, the question wasn't about how long an attestation result will be valid. The original question was how often some entity reaches out to reattest. Right? And so uh, draft 08 uh, is the one that talked about, uh, uh, I pinned it to the same one. That is to recover, the TEEP agent must be able to reach out to the TAM. For example, whenever the request policy check API, which is already in section 61, is invoked by a timer or other event. Okay. 
And the point here is to say the time window is actually bound, you know, the time window from a security purpose is bound by the duration of the attestation result. Okay? After that, you just can't do the authorized operations because your time window has expired per se. So how often you reach out depends on how, how, how fast you want to recover, right? Do you want to recover as soon as it expires? Do you want to recover more or less frequency? The point is the request policy check API in 621 already talks about having a timer associated with it. And so this just says by reference, it's probably that timer, but you could do something different. That's the or other event. You can see the, the, the quote from what is in 6.2.1 that it already said EG based on a timer there. So my belief as a editor is that the two things together in bold uh, do incorporate the discussion we had at the February meeting the extent that it needs to be covered in the TEEP document as opposed to the RATS architecture document. I'd love to hear anybody else's comments on how well you think we did here and if there's other things we should keep into keep in mind in the RATS architecture or in the TEEP architecture on this. If I don't hear anything, then we can go on and I will assume silence is consent. Next, we can go back if we need to. Okay, um, I think Hannes didn't couldn't make the February intro meeting, and so I carried this slide over from February to make sure that we have consensus. Um, although we did make a change in draft 08. So uh, this original question was about whether personalization data requires confidentiality or whether there is anything that um, only needs integrity but might be device specific by instance specific meaning you have two different devices with TEEs and the information you send to one is different from the information you send to the other right that's sort of the definition of personalization data personalized to a particular device okay. um, originally before the February interim meeting the text said personalization data must be encrypted other than that, there's no limitations. And so uh, Hannes filed this TPR about, well, maybe there's things that only need integrity. So maybe must should be may need to, right? So that was what the issue was filed. Okay? This is the slide, other than the one over three in the title, it was the slide from the February meeting, which we discussed. But Hannes wasn't there. So continue on. We'll talk about what uh, uh, we did. Next slide. So I'm going to go to 203. Okay. So this was some of the comments that led up to the discussion uh, about. Uh, and we talked about this one a little bit in the February meeting as well, which was um, encryption support is needed and it may be encrypted, doesn't enforce the recommendation to implement encryption, right? And so you can see as a requirement, the protocol must be able to support personalization data encryption. We then discussed that at the February interim and you see comments in the uh, etherpad from the February min minutes like this one, uh, Russ had said uh, implementations must support encryption to allow for loading of sensitive personalization data, right? So the consensus in the February interim meeting was that um, the important point was to say that encryption support is mandatory to implement, right? Encryption implementations must support encryption. And then the rest can be left up to the T protocol document to say whether any particular message is actually encrypted or not. That doesn't have to be in the architecture per se, that could be in the T protocol. So taking Russ's point or uh, language here about implementations must support encryption and Ming just above, that leads us to the last slide here. Next one uh, on this topic is what we did in 08. You can see it used to say the personalization must be encrypted and it now says roughly based on Russ's language, implementations must support encryption of personalization data to blah, blah, blah. So the must be encrypted is replaced with must support encryption. And again, that the point is much better to me. Um, I think uh, the main point is to, to, to move the rest of the discussion to the TEAT protocol document and just call out the security impact here. Right. Um, and I think that's um, something still for us to think about. Like when we, we, we talked about the personalization data in the past, and what we then said what we would do is uh, we put it at the same, uh, it, it's sort of data that also uh, comes along with the manifest. Um, and that's great. The uh, confidentiality protection is supported there, so the, so the new language um, fits in there. Um, however, I still think that there is something for us to think about in on the architecture side, not necessarily in the architecture document, but uh, for the implementation of this in the with the protocol. Because imagine if you if uh, the protocol runs to 
an implementation in a, in let's say an ordinary um, trusted application that maybe where the uh, the endpoint is inside the DE, and really um, this is different from the actual application that will then uh, use that data. So, like the the notion of end-to-end -end security, and specifically if you worry about who gets access to um, personal personalization data, I think. Um, um, makes me believe that in some cases it may be more desi desirable to, to actually have the um, trusted application then do whatever it needs to do to um, sort of strip that data or do something about it without um, involving the implementation of the of the end protocol endpoint. Does that make sense, or do I need to sort of post drawing also? Sounds like you have uh, thoughts on what might go into the cheap protocol document, but what I uh, I also thought I heard from you that you were fine with this in the architecture document and then continuing the discussion in the cheap protocol document, which was the intent of this issue. So. Okay, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. So since you have time for the cheap protocol uh, document, feel free to come up with something by the time you you're, you're up later. But <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. This is me. I just note that to comment that on. This is a talk about like a implementation, right? Implementation in a time side and in tip agent side. Right? Tip agent side support the different kind of TS. Some TS may not need the personal data encrypted. Some may. Right? So then, as a, a provider, tip agent should have this capability. Right. But I, I would like to point out, um, and 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 clearly, this is a discussion for later. It's like um, where, where are the endpoints um, for that encryption? Where does it start and where does it end? Uh, and the DE is not like the DE is a has multiple different places where things can be uh, decrypted. Yeah, yeah, that was the implementation. I'm saying but for right the, the, the TP architecture, the assumption would be the TP agent and the TAM would be the endpoints of the encryption. Yeah. Now, uh, we've previously talked about cases where you might also have something where the payload itself is encrypted and secret from the TAM, and that's not what this is talking about, but that is also actually, no, I think we did add something somewhere else about that, maybe in the same section here, because the uh, we had this point about uh, how you can have two different TAMs, one for personalization data and one for, say, the, the, the regular uh, TA binary, for example. So I thought we actually added some text in a different issue yeah. somewhere. But but for example, um, Dave, even in your implementation, you you run the code as a regular TA, not a, a TA with special special privileges that implement the uh, um, the deep uh, agent on the on the DE side. And there, um, if for example, if you do a, um, an update of a of another trusted application, then um, that update will be verified by code that is uh, by, by keys that is elsewhere in in the DE. Uh, typically code that um, resides, uh, runs at a much higher privileges in the DE. So, and so I think even there, um, I believe there's a, a security qualitative difference. And I think that also carries over to the personalization data. And I, I'm, I'm I would, not sure I followed that, but it, if you're talking about a personalization protocol, you feel free to draw a picture, right? But, yeah. um, it sounds like uh, everybody that's spoken up so far is because uh, really the question is, can we consider 132 as being, you know, issue on the architecture document as being done and move the discussion to the TEAP protocol? So far, everybody that's spoken up has been in favor of that, even though there's more discussion on the protocol document. That's really the question I've asked is, is, is the changes that are made here sufficient uh that we've now addressed all the issues right that's what i'm trying to do and that's the goal of this slide deck is to verify whether draft 08 um, solves all of the issues close enough to be done with it and move the other discussion to the other documents or are there changes that we still want uh, in addition to what's in draft 08 right that's the that's the main goal of this particular presentation so please speak up if you think that you want more changes than what we've done in the architecture document itself So I think this discussion will continue and we have time to talk about uh, deep protocol stuff, whether it's in this call or after this call. So uh, I guess next slide, Nancy, unless anybody else wants to speak up. Okay. So as you recall, the next steps after the interim meeting was to address those comments and then do a second work second working group last call. So based on the feedback that I've heard in this call so far, um, my 
my personal conclusion as an editor is that we are ready for a second working group last call. And so I'll hand that back to the uh, chairs to decide whether they want to do that. Yeah, I, I think we, we are, I mean, I, I haven't heard a lot of discussions. I also wanted to take a pause because I don't see any note <laughs> of the discussion that just ensued in the ether pad. So, and Jim, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just write it. Yeah, I'll paste that out writing in a notepad. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I was expecting to see things going on the Etherpad. Okay. So that said, I think what I'd like to do is solicit volunteers to actually review the architecture document because, if I recall, we only had Nikolai and Theo provide feedback. So can I get at least? Another volunteer, hopefully two, to help review this um, and ensure that we, we have more comments coming in the second working group last call. Wow, really? Nobody? Daniel, what about you? Yeah, Daniel, Mr. McGall, would you be able to review? Okay, we'll do that. Thank this you. is Russ, I'll review it. Thanks. Uh, yet another okay, so we'll issue a, a working group last call for that as well. Um, So with that, unless there's no other comments, let's uh, move on to the next one. So Dave, that's you on the transport side. Yep. That's the transport document. Okay, great. Uh, I think so now we're on the uh, TEEP over HTTP document. Um, the file name still has OTRP in it, but that's because we did not want to change the file name at this point, because that'll go away once we eventually have an RFC. So keep going. TEEP over HTTP. Okay, so the timeline on this one was um, we did a working group last call. So the IETF 106 was to uh, uh, do the changes talked about on IETF 106, then start a working group last call. That was then uh, done in February, um, which the working group last call ended on February 26th, and we got two reviews. Thank you to Russ and Tiru in particular for those two reviews. Those were great. Um, also in April, Mark Nottingham did a recheck for conformance with the uh, BCP 56 BIS. That's how to do protocols over HTTP uh, document. He had done a review early on and he did a re-review in April. So technically we've had three reviews uh, since working group last call started. So uh, next slide. Okay. So the top list are things that were discussed by ETF 106, right? So one, two, and four were things that were addressed before then, and we just verified that they could be closed. Uh, five was uh, one that we believed was done and, and wanted to get, so, well, actually, five was one we had questions to the work group as to what to do. Uh, the outcome of that was to remove discussion, remove um, the TEEP over uh, OTRP discussion from the document. Okay. So that was the outcome of, of the ITF 106 discussion. And then since working group last call was started, there was uh, four new issues that came in, uh, plus various pieces of editorial feedback from Russ and Tiru that didn't, have, that didn't get issues filed, issues were filed on all the main technical points. And if we missed some, uh, the last slide on here calls out a couple other questions about are they actually um, are technical issues or things that you wanna bring up. So Russ and Tiru, please keep in mind if there's something that I don't call out here, uh, please feel free to bring it up after the call or after the the, the end of the other issues here. So we're going to walk through the uh, ones that are on here, and then I got a slide on editorial feedback. So go ahead, next slide. Okay, so uh, number eight was filed where uh, Akira sent this question, but then in the issue itself, um, uh, Akira and I commented and we said that this should be moved to the T protocol. Um, rather than the transport spec. And so I think both of us, meaning the filer and the editor, both agree that this one can be closed. 
but I didn't go ahead and close it. Uh, we probably can because there's now a T protocol issue. So I don't think there's anything to discuss here, given that everybody agrees that this was filed on a rub document. So. Number 11 is um, the uh, call that uh, the chairs put out about, you know, JSON versus CBOR support and TEEP. And our understanding is the working group consensus was to use CBOR and not JSON, but all the examples in the uh, product in the transport spec used uh, TEEP plus JSON. And so number 11 was we updated the examples to use CBOR. Now, the actual content doesn't actually appear in the examples. It's just the media type appears in the HTTP header. And so the HTTP header, that's the content type and accept header, um, was changed from uh, JSON to CBOR to match that consensus. Uh, and by the way, the actual value of the media type is normative in the T protocol document, right? That's where the ANA considerations are that actually defines that. The transport document just says, use the media type defined by your, by, by, that you're using out of the, out of the uh, protocol document. And so it's just an informative here. You don't have to do any IANA considerations changes, just use an example because it points to the to the uh, uh, protocol spec. So that one was pretty easy. Uh, next slide. Okay. So this one is an interesting discussion to see uh, are we on the right track? Did I do the right thing or not? So Originally, the question, uh, Tiru, in his review, said, um, what kind of guidance do you have and what are the privacy and security implications uh, if you do say, because it didn't say what version of TLS or what the requirements are around which versions of TLS you support or you don't support or whatever. And he said, well, what about if you're using TLS 1.2? What are the issues? Because, you know, TLS 1.3 fixes some, and so do you need to call those out and so on. Um, uh, so I asked Mark Nottingham what they did with BCP 56 bis, right? Which is again the document that says how to write protocol documents over that use HTTP as a transport, right? And I noticed that that document also didn't have such guidance. And so uh, I asked him, so why is that? And he said um, in his email, uh, he said, well, we in 56 bis avoided this issue since it's not HTTP specific, right? We didn't think it was our job up at our layer to give that guidance either, right? And so that didn't really answer my question. So, um, however, uh, what we found is that the security considerations, I think the types of things that you're looking for are actually covered in BCP 195, right? Where BCP 195 is the RFC that gives the recommendations for what you should do around TLS and DTLS too. But the question here is TLS, right? So what are the recommendations, covers TLS versions and, and what you should and shouldn't do and all that kind of stuff. And so it already does that in a way that's not HTTP specific, right? And so the, uh, what I've done in the transport spec is to add the bolded text, right? Which is after the point that it talks about TLS for the first time, right? The TLS certificates must be checked um, to see BCP 195 for additional TLS recommendations, right? To say all of that applies as a BCP. The rationale for why I thought that this might be a good resolution is that that document already has IETF consensus, so we don't have to spend lots of time arguing about what it might say. Um, but um, then you can still say, well, what about all the TEEP specific stuff? Well, TEEP is secured end to end inside of HTTP, right? So in theory, there shouldn't be really anything significant that's TEEP specific to say, right? Because it's any, any TEEP specific security issue is the TEEP protocol's job to solve, not TLS jobs protocol. So any of the TLS considerations shouldn't actually be TEEP specific. At least that's the that's the claim. And so the belief is because TEEP is secured end to end, then all that's necessary, in my opinion, is to reference BCP 195 as the best current practice for what to do about TLS. So that's why I did that. And so if anybody disagrees or thinks we need to say more in a way that's TEEP specific, now is your time to speak up and give some recommendations. There's this. Um... RRC that talks about uh, the use of TLS for IoT devices, and uh, maybe you could um, add a reference to that too. Okay, is that the one that's the TLS profile from from Elliot? Okay. Hey, hey, Dave. Uh, uh, the text uh, you're referring to in RFC two eight one eight, I think it's pointing to an old uh, mechanism for doing PKS validation. So. I think you need to point to the right document for doing certificate checks. 2818 um, is not the right reference. Um, this 
uh, text is largely taken directly from uh, BCP 56 bis. And so if you believe that that reference is not correct, you should also follow up with Mark Nottingham because when he did his recheck, I asked him, do you believe that this is still saying the right thing? And he said, yep, still looks good to me or still looks okay, I think was his exact quote. Uh, I'll, so, I'll, I'll, I'll inform uh, him. Uh, yeah. uh, if, if that one changes as well, I'm happy to make an equivalent change into here. But right now it says, you know, uh, document should say the following and I'm saying the following. And so if I change it, then I'm out of conformance to that unless it changes also. Sure. So maybe we can start a thread with at least the three of us, if not the list or whatever, uh, to just get him to confirm that. But since this is a change for the HTTP BIS working group um, to change the recommendation as to what we should say, then uh, I would like him to buy off on that. I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying I want to keep in sync with other document. Yeah, because PKS is discussed in 6.125, which is an latest update. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the 2818 is not referring to that. So if you'd like to propose a change either to here or to 56 bis, because the language is almost the same, and as long as uh, the HTTP bis, as long as the editor of 56 bis, which is Mark, as long as he incorporates it into BCP 56 bis, um, then I'm happy to make exactly the same change here. So. Sure. Okay, so uh, you have an XM to follow up on, and I will happily go along as soon as uh, Mark at least acknowledges that he will put it into there. If he pushes back in any reason, then, I think we should hold off and figure it out. I don't imagine he'll push back, but we'll see. So. Okay, it anyone else? That both of them should be referenced. Say that again, Rush. I think both documents should be referenced here. 2818 yeah. and 6125. Yeah. yeah, that might be the simplest um, fix is just uh, Rush, your suggestions right before the period to say and RFC, whatever that number was. Is that right? Is that your suggestion? Actually, <clears throat> what we could uh, what we could use we could use uh, reference to uh, sixty one twenty five. Um, yep. I think that would be better. Just uh, replacing the reference to two eight one eight. you want them both on us. That's fine for me too. So I, if I remember right, HTTP BIS working group owns the particular BCP 56 BIS and they are not under the security area. So if we have a recommendation, they're not under the security area. If we have a recommendation, they ought to go along with it. So like if it was say, you know, uh, Russ and Tiro and all of us had this conversation in the interim meeting, feel free to check our minutes here, but our recommendation is to change your 56 BIS following then that would be a, a security working group recommendation to a non-security working group. Okay, well, I did, hopefully somebody can capture that the RFC number in the ether pad because I've not forgotten what it was, so. Yeah, I've captured that. Okay, great, thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, day one comment was that uh, RFC 6125 just talks about PKX based certificate validation. I think the architecture draw, uh, draft talks about self-signed certifications other. So do you want to refer to some of the specification for those uh, TLS certificates to be validation? Mm -hmm. 6125 does not cover uh, self-signed certificates or private CA. But does 2818? I don't think so. Because HTTPS does not typically discuss uh, private CA. Um. I'm not it's sure uh, that really matters. R right. I think I don't think what's typical is important. I think since the 56 bis is talking about guidance for people using HTTP as a transport, um, it doesn't mean people typically the, the use HTTP as a transport in typical situations. I'm saying 56 bis should cover you know the wide range of stuff, including you know IoT and so on. Yeah, I didn't see anything in the US. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like Tiro, you currently have the action item on this one, and I will happily make a change as soon as we can get to it. So I just want to make sure we have uh, uh, agreement on who's got the next step here, and I will uh, wait for you. Uh, but if we can get that done quickly, that would be awesome. So Dave, technically you're out of time, but I'll give you a few more minutes given that. Okay, are we actually pressed for time on the call? I thought you told me that we were not as pressed for time, but I'm. Happy to take. Yeah, well, that's because we didn't have the T protocol, but 
think okay. I think we're we're going to be fine. So keep moving. We have another. I remember right. Yeah, uh, the other we comment that I see is uh, uh, is the conditional use of HTTPS. I think uh, even Ben had the same comment that I had posted in the. I have that on a later slide. I have that on a later slide. So I want to get to that. Sure. Uh, so Nancy, okay. time check. My understanding is we've gone for forty five minutes, and I thought that the invitation was two hours. Is that not correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, which is why I said I think we've got time. So yeah, we've got an hour and fifteen minutes. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did not account for Hannes. So. Okay. You've got time. Okay, great. Um, so the next one was about TAM certificate caching. The OTR piece, the history was the OTR piece spec did have uh, text in there that talks about uh, caching the TAM certificate. So the TEEP agent could learn the TAM certificate, cache it, and so when it needed to reach out to the TAM, it could immediately encrypt with the uh, TAM's uh, public key without having to ask for a round trip to actually go and fetch it again. Right. That was what the caching was for. Uh, mm -hmm. The TEEP spec does not yet have any discussion about caching, right? Because the TEEP spec is much newer. Um, it, um, rather than passing the certificate directly, again, this is my understanding of how OCSP data works. Somebody will correct me if I have this wrong. Uh, the TEEP spec uses OCSP data. The OCSP data contains certs. Um, one of those certs would be the TAMS cert, uh, but it doesn't mention yet caching yet, right? That's issue 17 that was filed in the TEEP protocol. So here's the change that I made and Hopefully I didn't get this wrong, but somebody I'm sure will correct me if I did. Uh, so it now references if it's already had a cached TAM OCSP data that it trusts based on a previous query request. Okay, so it basically, without being able to reference a section yet, it references what the actual field is that would carry the uh, stuff and what the message that it would be on. That's the closest that I can do right now without having that discussion in the T protocol spec. So again, the intent is that uh, you should be able to cache the TAMS um, OCSP data so that you have its public key, so that you can encrypt the message to the TAM by sending a query response without having received a query request for it. This is the very first uh, query request, query response exchange. You can skip the initial connect, get back to the uh, same query request it would send to everybody and just immediately send the query response that you would have sent had that happened. There's no questions. I will assume I got it right and go on. The only change that I would make if there was a T protocol discussion is to add actually a reference to a section number in the T protocol spec, which we could do once we have a T protocol. But I don't think it's necessary. I think it would be helpful. All right. So here's the other. Um, uh, here's the things that are not sort of open questions. These are the trivial editorial ones. I have one more slide after this one. Um, so we had a note about user agent strings being implementation specific. That was in response to Ross about the foo and bar uh, and what the meaning of those are. The second one was to add an informative reference for quick because it's used in a diagram to illustrate where the broker boundary can be between the REE and the TE. And uh, Tiro pointed out about uh, the notes in there about firewalls would also apply to NATs, and so he said, and NATs. And so those are all editorial. I don't think they need to be discussed unless uh, Russ or Tiro think want to reopen them, because I think those are just editorial. So let's go into the last slide, which calls out, I think it's the last slide. I think I put them all the same. Okay, here's the three possibly open questions. These are things that were asked that I gave an answer for, but I don't know whether we have consensus on there. And so the first one is about the use of um, uh, the discussion around using HTTP as opposed to HTTPS. Okay. And so we've had a bunch of discussion about this in the past. The main technical answer for allowing HTTP not H without TLS is if you have constrained devices that use T, since that's end to end secure inside by using COSE, right? And if they don't have the code space or whatever else to put in a TLS implementation, then they could still use T, right? Because it's already secured inside. It introduced a couple of extra DOS and some issues, but it's still the T part itself is secure. The secondary answer is for debugging. And I heard a couple people, Ben and uh, I forget who else, has said, well, you know, maybe we should remove the discussion of debugging because it's in there in a sentence. And so what do you guys think on this one? Yeah, I think if it's just for debugging, I think I don't think it should end, it should be discussed in the protocol specification. Uh, debugging people can do whatever they want, but uh... Uh, have, it does not make sense in the specification document. Yeah, 
This is me and so I agree. I think maybe we don't have to mention this one, but I think maybe answer is good, right? So it's because TP yeah. soft define product level E to E. So transport security is not that mandatory. So why the OTP is open? Yeah, so I understand the proposal from Tiru and seconded by Ben is to just remove the phrase that talks about N for uh, debugging and only leave mention of the first case. I would say a first case is okay. Enough. Okay. And, and unless there's any other counter proposals, I'm going to assume that is direction to the editors. If you'd like to speak up to say you want some other direction, let me know. But otherwise, I will take that as as the direction to the editor. Okay. Uh, second question raised um, was, and I th think this came out of uh, Tiru, your uh, review was. Um, should we actually specify what the HTTP error codes are, right? Right now, the text just basically says, use an appropriate HTTP error code. So, you know, your 200 level, 400 level, 500 level, whatever, use an appropriate one and figure it out. Um, and so I'd asked uh, in Mark uh, Nottingham, hey, if you're 56 bit stuff, what do you think protocol should do with respect to specifying HTTP error codes, right? And his response was, uh, well, his response was, what you don't want is you don't want the receiver to have like a switch statement on a particular code, you know, to rely on there being, you know, a 404 versus, uh, you know, a 50, whatever. So the, the, the receiver should only base behavior on whether it's 200 level, 400 level, or 500 level. So you have to be careful to not over specify things in a way that would cause receivers because the actual error codes themselves within the 200, 400, 500 level might vary greatly by implementation. Okay. And so, uh, Mark's comment was he thought that the text looked okay as it was, but I didn't put that as a resolve here. I want to ask that and get any discussion here is now that you know, I forwarded Mark's response to the list, right? So, uh, with his permission, the question is, is there anything more specific that we want to do here? Or is, are we okay with, his, with the current answer to the question? Because it wasn't a request for change. It was a question. I'll ask Kiru first. Do you, if you've heard this and seen what Mark said, do you believe we should do something, or was is your question sufficiently answered? Yeah, I like the Mark's suggestion of returning the error codes from the server, but not specifying the client behavior. That seems like a good way of at least saying what the server should do, at least there's defining no, the server. There's no specific things we can say. Use this specific error in response to this particular thing, right? The 200 is success and. You know, the 400 and 500 have specific meanings about internal server error or temporary or whatever, but um, I, don't, I couldn't think of anything we could say that implementations would need to do or anything that was tied to a particular yeah. event in the team and protocol. I, and I think one important aspect is that most of the error codes, when they happen at the deep level, they actually don't populate down. So it may be if you have an error at the deep level, it still it may still be a 200 okay, um, but then it's an error at the deep level. I think that's also what um, an important point. Uh, um, the HTTP bits uh, or, or the HTTP PCP document says that you are not supposed to dictate uh, the error code that the application from the application down to the HTTP layer. Right. Right. All right. Now my proposal is to do nothing here other than maybe you know keep discussing it or whatever. But I can't think of any change that actually makes sense in the document yet. If somebody else would like to propose one, feel free. But right now. I thought about this and after my discussion with Mark and so on, I don't think there's any change that I could make that uh, that would make sense. So. Okay, well, I'll let people think about that one. Uh, the last question that I have on my slides here is, um, um, and I don't remember who asked this and if it was um, you or Ben or somebody, why is 56 bits an informative reference? And the short version is, uh, well, it's not used in any normative statement, right? It's used in security considerations where it says for other security considerations, see 56 bis, right? The security considerations are extremely relevant. And so I can only imagine three possibilities. And right now my opinion is we're taking the right one, which is don't reference 56 bis at all, okay? Um, where I think that would be a problem because we'd have to copy in all the security considerations that are in 56 bis. Um, there's do what we're doing now is informative reference and there's make it be normative. And then I'd have to have a normative statement that references it. And right now, my opinion is we're doing the right thing of making it be informative. So that was a question, and I'm hoping I didn't follow an issue because it was the question. So, and this is my last slide. So, if there are things that are not on here that you, uh, Russ or Tira, brought up in your review that we have not talked about that you want to talk about, this is your last uh, chance on the call here. Otherwise, it would have been the list. Uh, 
Oh, this is Russ. I'm okay. Thank you, Russ. I think this pretty much covers all my comments. Thanks. All right, great. Then, uh, uh, so I, I, do I have a next steps question on here? Or was that the last slide, Nancy? Maybe. Okay. So the next steps, I got direction on the uh, debugging one, and if Kiru gets a change on the TLS considerations one, I can do that. And so. Right now, I'm expecting right now that I would uh, push another one. Although, if we can get a alignment with 56 bis soon, then I'd like to get both of those changes into the same document. Um, and then I will leave it to the chairs as to whether we need another working group last call or not after that, given that we had, what, three reviews uh, since working group last call was started. Yeah, I mean, admittedly, I had not counted Mark as an official review. Um, so. He's going to put Ming on the spot. Ming, would you mind reviewing it? And, um... Yes, yes, actually, I like that too. This is Hannes. And I, I submitted the PR um, for the TLS issue uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, great. So if you guys can do that and provide feedback, um, I guess if you can, um, because Dave, you might need to do some of the, the smaller edit, editorial notes too um, for, for another rev. Can do another rev as I can do another rev as soon as we can close on the other ones, whether it's you know this week or whatever. So it's it's right, right, right. Um, so anyway, if we can get that done, then um, what I would want to do is just confirm that everybody is okay with that latest version. Um, after Ming and Hannes have also provided um, comments or reviewed, and then um, hopefully we can go to publication. So do you want Ming and Hannes to review the draft 06 that's out right now, or do you want to no. wait for some? Okay, just making sure we're doing that in parallel. So. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Was that clear, Ming and Hannes? Just wait until. Uh, yeah, I'll wait for, oh, yeah, wait for Davis and let his update and then review the latest uh, grid. So just a second. Do you want them to review 06 that's out right now, or a, ne a future one that hasn't been posted yet? Which was the one that you're asking them to review? The future one that hasn't been posted yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Extend right. the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So with that, um, Kira, you're up next. Yeah. Is my mic working? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, this is about a report about having a virtual hackathon and all. The reason of having a hackathon was to have, uh, make a feedback reflecting from the implementation to the draft. So, um, yes, and initially we were planning to just have a, a physical hackathon in Japan when the announcement was decided to cancel ITIP 107. But later, uh, um, even in Japan, meeting and face-to-face in the meeting room was started to be prohibited in many organizations. So we end up having a virtual hackathon in Japan time zone. Yes. Um, next page, please. Yes. So um, yeah, so we had a virtual hackathon in Japan time. And so um, pretty much, that's what it is here. Yes. Uh, next page, please. I don't think I could. I'm going to spend 25 minutes. <laughs> well, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. So um. This um, um hackathon in Berlin. Um. Deep is going to have only Seaboard, um, represented format. <laughs> Still. Uh. Query response and trust up uh, trusted application install and trusted application daily sequences the same. So we wanted to have at least all one plus three working, and we also wanted to start Seabor um, implementation starting and and also um, my initial prototype was on ARM. And we should have been working on risk five, but not much yet. And so we wanted to work on SGX and not, not, 
not all in Japan was um, uh, quite good. Um, I'm thinking it's deep, deep draft is, is able to applicable on SGX. So yeah, we just wanted to confirm it's it's going to be fine or not. Next page, please. Yes, yes. End up ten ten attendees, even and from day further from Microsoft. Yes, from from um, is it Seattle? Yeah, time zone. So it's probably it was eleven o'clock midnight in his time. And and most of the other members, uh, people have been. Um, attending to I defend the path or uh, hackathon in Berlin. So thank you for all ten people attendees. I that was this was my first time to hosting hackathon, and first first time to be becoming as as a virtual hackathon. So yes, thank you. And next page, please. And. To prepare a virtual hackathon, um, yes. Thank you for coming to um, hosting um, video conference system. VCube is almost identical as a web WebEx, and and also we um, I Robox um, provided the I router, so I set up the HTTP IPsec, so. Um, Ham server and device will be able to connect inside that VPN, and not to harm any public internet with the buggy packets. Yes, and it it worked uh, uh it worked perfectly. Slightly had a dis uh disconnection on VPN, but um yeah, other than that, it was it worked perfectly. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, so this is what uh, what happened at the hackathon. So we we never really finished with the, even the three sequences in JSON format. So we 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 finished it. We confirm it was working with Isobesan's TAM server and my device. And and that, and now from the the virtual hackathon to until today, I was able to focus on Cbo format. Oh, that was good. It helped a lot. And Seaboard format, um, during the virtual hackathon, we didn't finish implementing the making a um, message in Seaboard format, but we started to prepare the library in the header de description of a uh, um, uh, binary. Uh, Decoding and binary presentation in the, um, 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 in the code, and Takita-san was uh, already working on the libc suit library, so it's it was really helpful from him his expertise to um, um, teaching other people about the Cbor message. Thank you. And, and next page, please. And and another team was um, there wasn't much people was able to build the TAM SGX TAM server by Dave. So Oisan was only the person who was able to uh, build the TAM server in the device. So and taught everybody else how to do the, the same. And then and and then we started to um, try connecting TAM server and device inside the VPN. And Dave, thank you for staying up your late for hosting your um, time server. And next page, please. Yes. Um, so, C4 representation or what do you call uh, CDDL format in the draft? Um, yes. We, when we started the implementation, um, we, we yeah we saw some places we could use the P 
packets or binary strings inside a message reduce the size because Cbor meant to be smaller uh, binary format than ASN1 or other um, formats. So, and that's what I've been what I've been working after virtual hackathon until today and and few email on the mailing list today. And probably that's going to be the discussion on the next topic from um, Hannes. And and also, we, yes, people in Japan was was calm down. Yeah, people could work on SGX. So yes, um, that was that was that uh, was personally good for me. Yes. Next page, please. Yes. Um. Yeah. Hackathon works on virtually, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, and also it helps a lot um, having a vi vi uh, video and text chat and v VPN. And one thing I noticed was face-to-face -face hackathon is directly talking to each other, but uh, um, virtual one, we use a lot of text chat. We use one, one of the chat tools um, we, uh, had on on side was Slack, and it was yeah it was um, text chat is also good. Um, technical discussion is able to read and um, copy and paste on your machine, which uh, which which is good, which is nice. Yeah. Um, yes, and next page, please. Um, yeah, this is the summary. So, um, thank you. And, um, yeah. And then, uh, we, we, I have a, after the virtual hackathon, I pretty much have a clear idea how the CBOR format and binary for, uh, re binary file works. So, um, yes, I'm going to start more, uh, pull requests on the GitHub. For the CBOR message, and also, I have before making a CBOR uh, um, modific. I mean, uh, met, um, discussion on the MIDI mix. I was half doing converting the protocol XML file to Markdown file, but I didn't finish it. So I might finish it sometime, not tomorrow, but maybe next week or yes, sometime. And for me, editing markdown file is easier than XML file. But yes. Okay, that's about it. Any question? I think Are that you aware? Was... Go ahead. Are you aware that I have a tool for doing the XML to markdown conversion? So maybe you can just send me the XML and I'll do it for you. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yes. I pretty much finished on the only few things um, remaining is the chart. It was written, still written in the XML inside. But um, yes. Okay. okay. Um, oh well. well, this sounds pretty cool. So, um, any other issues, lessons learned that came out from the hackathon? Kira or Dave? Yes. No, I thought that the use of a, a VPN actually worked well so that we could test uh, things that might want to be on the internet and so on was, was really not a problem. So I thought the use of VPN was great. Yes. VPN will provide uh, having all the TAM and devices for the, all the um, hackathon uh, attendees machine in the same segment. The problem is the VPN is going is in, encrypted with IPsec, so it's... Um, Going through video conference packet through VPN is won't work well. So we, most of the people end up having two machine and one for development machine and one for um, hosting video conference machine. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think that had to do with how the routing was set up so that um, when, because uh, all that would have been necessary minimally if we're going to do it again in the future is if the VPN has no default route, right? Because we, because we were always using unlink addresses to talk to each other, right? Um, 
And so that meant that whenever we were trying to get out to the internet, then the default route was going across there. I think that was the real problem. If, if I was going to do this in the future, I would try to set up a VPN and figure out a way to configure it so that there was no default route. Mm. Uh, I'll talk, yes. And, sure. also, <laughs> and also IPsec, L, L2, um, L2TP IPsec works well with all different machines, Windows, Mac, Ubuntu, uh, Linux. Uh, Fedora, whatever. Only uh, um, my setup was using NAT to have everybody in the same segment and had to change one line in the register in Windows. So if Windows in in the future, if they <laughs> if it falls back to NAT traversal mode, it will be nice. But um, it's alright. <laughs> So do you have another hackathon planned, Akira? Um, yeah, um, so yes, we, we, we have a discussion having a hackathon locally, physically in Japan. Um, right now, situation is getting more intense in Tokyo. Probably it might have a lockdown in Tokyo in, um, in this, this or next week. But um, after that, if things calms down, yes. Definitely, sometimes. Virtual, yeah, because I think we also was... had this. Um, we had this plan uh, for the IETF hackathon, which unfortunately was uh, demolished uh, by yeah. um, by Charles and so on. But because uh, we spent some time setting that one up, um, so I think it would be worthwhile to schedule another virtual hackathon, whether some people are um, grouped together locally, physically, um, or not. That um, I think that should be. Be fine in both ways. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Charles was willing to do the virtual, by the way. It was just. Um, I understand. I'm not blaming him, but uh, it was just unfortunate because, um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. For me, the, having a virtual hackathon and working on Seaboard for my great achievement was. I was able to use my old expertise when I was junior high school or high school, uh, writing down, reading the documentation of the uh, e-protocol and writing down how the binary should work by reading and then changing the binary for the converting the CDDR format. <laughs> yeah, it took me a whole week class, one week, but it was, yeah, fun. Let me know if you guys want to host another virtual hackathon. We can see what we can do. All right. Thank you, Akira. Okay. So with that, uh, let's see. We have, I think, 48 minutes, if my math is right. I might be 10 minutes off. Um, Hannes. Hey, could you could you open the, uh, the pull request and... Uh, and share? And, yeah. And the uh, issue list. Posted the link in the WebEx chat in case anybody wants to open it themselves. Okay, which one did you want me to? Um, oh, it helps if I share. One second. Okay, can you see my browser sharing the um, yeah it works the issues and I yeah. toggle back and forth between the issues and the pull requests. I see okay. pull requests. Yeah. Yep. Start with the pull requests. I think that's easier. Then we jump over to the issues. Um, okay. So I um the first one number fourteen, which was actually um came out. Uh, we had a discussion maybe on the list. Well, we had that one on the on the list. Uh, the integer for the token and there the issue was initially that um 
there was this this question about the nonce, which we used um, in context of the um, work done in RATS with the entity attestation token, which allows the, the dam to, as a demonstration of lightness, send the nonce over to the um, to the device, and then the device returns uh, the token back, the e token, which includes then the nonce. Uh, so we clarified that one on the list that this nonce needs to be um, uh, relatively long, so there's some indications on how long that's supposed to be in the each specification, and if we just use the same um, lens, then we won't have any issues. Um, but then the topic of like, what about the token? The token is used, and that's a, a different uh, element in the protocol, is used to match the request against the response, um, or to the response. And so that's a, that's an um, I think it was uh, previously a, a byte string, and uh, the suggestion was to make it an integer. I was actually wondering um, what, why an integer we could actually make it an unsigned integer, but in general, uh, like an integer is the, the right thing to do. And um, I also stumbled over it when when I sort of converted my uh, JSON-based uh, implementation to to CBO. So I think. Um, Nancy, can you increase the, can you zoom it all in your browser window? Because the font is a little small. Um, um, so, Hannes, can you refresh your memories? What's the difference between the use of the token versus the nonce? In other words, given that you have a nonce, what is the, what is the token used for that the nonce doesn't already provide, if you can refresh our memory? Yeah, the, the the nonce is purely for the attestation information goes into the attestation. Then, uh, and if you don't request attestation, which is actually an option as well, then you wouldn't send the nonce. Um, the token is used to. Uh, is the nonce generated by the TAM? Uh, yes. Uh, so the the TAM creates the uh, the token as well as the nonce in both cases, and. Uh, but in case of the token, it um, sends the token or puts a number in there, and uh, the it's a nonce in a TEEP message, as opposed to inside a RATS formatted. Uh, uh, there is no RATS formatted message. Okay, so as long as the nonce is in the TEEP message, why do you need both a nonce and a token as opposed to only using one of the two? Because. Um, because they are used for a different purpose and the non shows up only in one message and uh, the token shows up in every message. So I guess the question I'm asking is why not put the nonce in every message is really the question I'm asking and, and get rid of the token. That's what I'm asking is what's the difference in purpose? The, the difference, the nonce is for the, uh, is in the query request, um, the TAM sends it um, to the client and uh, if it wants to get an, wants to get an attestation um, entity at the station token back, and then and that nonce would in the response would not show up in the in the deep message, but it would instead be included in the eat message as one of the claims. That's um, uh, having a token in the tape protocol is very uh, handy for the implementation because token is able to uh, use as a sequence of the uh, message. So if uh, one message from Tam and the reply is going to be from a device, and then it's just going to have inc inc incrementing the token number. Probably the most use cases, and that will be easy to track if when if the packet have lost or it's the packet is not received, we're just waiting or just the next packet came. Well, again. Why if the device has multiple uh, DEs and you send out multiple requests, you need to match the request um, or correlate the response to the request. Uh, that's why there's some. Um... So I was like curious to hear so uh, comment on the sequence number. I would that potentially have some issue, but uh, you want the people guess it. There's no sequence number. Uh, the token is just a number. It doesn't need to be in sequence. Yeah. It has to be a sequence, yes. Right. You it have to be a sequence. A sequence, sequence and, and the token is used because you can have multiple outstanding requests at the same time. Is that right? Actually. Because it's all over a, 
right now anyway, it's all over a uh, a transport session that provides serialization. So it's, so you only need this if you actually have multiple outstanding query requests. But uh, remember that we also support uh, devices with multiple TEs. There's no reason why you wouldn't send multiple uh, requests at the same time. Different TEs, correct. And like lens-wise, that's also a huge difference. So um, I I recommended to to use unsigned integer. And I saw Carsten also um, sort of uh, in the belief that this is a uh, uh, better. Um, there's yeah. I highly prefer unsigned int. Yes, mm. for, uh, easier for computer language to ma match match in uh, binary integer than the string. Mm. Right. So, yes. I, I I think um, what I um, I would recommend is to sort of uh, change this pull request from uh, in to unsigned in, uh, but and then uh, merge it into the the protocol. I think that's good. But there will be more changes later with uh, in one of the issues that Akira raised on uh, um, sort of fine tuning the CDDL. Uh, so we we'll, we can uh, talk more about this um, aspect or this these type of changes in. There would be some work. Um, yeah, I would still like, I, I think you answered my question earlier uh, about why is there both. I'd like to see some text in the document. And I know that you added me as a uh, as a co-author, and so I may help to uh, author that text. But um, uh, when I was talking about rats formatted, you actually answered that by saying the nonce is in the rats formatted, which is eat, right? Just for, I didn't, right. I, not everyone in the call necessarily knows that it's eat, but when you say rats formatted, I just mean eat, right? So the nonce comes back in the query response to eat, and I think we just need some text in there to explain why both of them are in there. So I I I, I thought that I added some text, but um, I'm sure there's room for improvement here. Yeah. Great. Mm. Great. I don't think it came across, Hannah. So apparently not. Uh, so I uh, yeah, I need to I need to improve that. Yeah. And I I do I will make a proposal and see how you guys like it. Mm -hmm. I had a comment here. Remember, I saw the email is coming announced, right? What they should be integer on the, or it's a, how many bytes, right? Four bytes, eight bytes. That's a separate issue. It, yeah. It's not in the pull request. I think it's in the issue, in the issues it's list. It's not in this pull request, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next pull request. This one. Uh, adding text. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I um, since I was working on on the implementation, um, I thought that we need a little bit more text about creating and verifying the deep messages, and so I I created uh, uh, a pull request to do that. So if you go to the files changed um, tab, or whatever it is, yeah, uh, scroll down a little bit. So it's. Um, Made some changes here, not so relevant. Uh, yeah, actually, um, that's something I want to bring up. So previously, I this is goes back a little bit um, to earlier work where we actually allowed um, um, in signing and um, digital signatures and max. And but so far, um, the issue was that we only had. Uh, talked about in the architecture document at least talked about uh, digital signatures and not not Mac, and so I I ex sort of stripped that out um, and specifically um, to focus only on cozy sign one on the cozy sign one signature, which is um, as you know uh, for one signer. Um, I think we should be very uh, explicit about what functionality want, we want to support because COSI is kind of a broad toolbox and we shouldn't just wrap everything in because after all, this code will go into the trusted computing base, so we better be uh, a little bit selective. Um, yeah. I don't know if, if anyone has some, some thoughts about this. Maybe you guys have some use cases, um, for example, for the regular COSI sign which um, allows you to include multiple signatures, for example, uh, would allow you to sign with multiple algorithms. But I, I don't see that that's, a, that's a, um, an issue here. Yeah, uh, even in the um, suit manifest, it has uh, the same 
a member called Jose, uh, um, sorry, all this four different tags, but um, it's... yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, right, but suit uh, does have cases. Suit does have cases where you have counter signings, right? Because the author of the suit manifest and the TAM and many other entities besides just those two. But here, if messages are just coming from the TAM to the TIP agent, then maybe you don't need counter signing, which is, I think, what Han is asking. Yeah, yes. And um, what I want uh, was trying to say is, even in the suit manifest, it's how to represent this in the binary format was not clear in the suit manifest. So see, four, uh, yeah, these four tag was, it was, uh, Def define as any, so it doesn't know what which going to be binary string, uh, byte byte string, or num number, or yeah. So, um, yeah, so it, um, deleting from T protocol is perfectly fine for me. So Akira, if you have any uh, feedback on the suit manifest document, can I ask that you either send it to Brendan or uh, post it on the suit list? Okay. Yes, I will. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm so honest. This is Russ. I agree. I think the signature makes a lot more sense since uh, you expect the same code to be delivered to multiple T's. You think that the cosine, uh, sign one is good? Well, I don't care between sign and sign one. Jim's okay. probably a better person to comment on that. I'm saying I like the signature more than the Mac. Okay. Yeah. And I think if um, that's that's uh, my proposal, and of course, maybe there's someone else has some uh, specific use case and some ideas and we should uh, discuss it or maybe have it, uh, a new version or so. Um, um, okay. Anyway, um, if you scroll down a little bit. That's what you added, right? Um, say again. The green is what you're trying to add. Yeah, the... yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. So, so I added text for both um, uh, adding and verifying. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of um, kind of obvious um, in some sense, uh, but. Um, what it what it essentially says is like it talks about the cozy sign. It talks about populating the headers uh, according to uh, the cozy specification, and uh, and of course the content of the message or not obvious, but the content of the message goes into the um, sign payload. There are different options that cozy offers, and I'm, I'm basically uh, choosing one here. Um, and uh, and there's also um, I'm using a seaboard tag to indicate uh, that this is a a deep message. Uh, there's also a possibility to um, use that indication elsewhere, uh, but but I thought that that's uh, a kind of a sensible approach. What does line two sixty two mean when it says if the deep message is signed? Um, yeah. So so there I was a little unclear whether, um, for example, an error message. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to. To best treat the error message, or whether the error message uh, there could be cases where the deep message is not an error message is not signed. Uh, I think we should explicitly disallow that and force all messages to be signed. I think we talked about this in the context of the OTRP protocol, and that was the conclusion. I don't think we should be any weaker in the T protocol. Okay, okay, then I will change that. Yeah. Um, I think at the uh, Berlin hackathon, I think there was also a question that we answered during the hackathon about. Uh, that I Kira and folks ask, which was, um, are TEEP messages, when they put, get put in a cozy, are they signed and then encrypted, or is it encrypted and then signed? And I think it is answered, but I think in the section here on creating a TEEP message, I think the wording could be clearer about what the relationship is to encryption, what that happens, just in terms of the text. Um, so, um, at, at the moment, uh, like, there's only signatures, and uh, there's no encryption here in that sense at this level um so there has to be encryption at some level right there is uh it's, it's the whole the, point of the personalization data discussion right that would be at the at least that's what we said previously uh of course we can also change our mind but it was um at the level of what the the suit manifest and the um the sort of data that comes along with it uh would be there so that that's the place where the 
uh, encryption would go, but um, of, um, currently the text doesn't uh, talk about this, and, and I think obviously it should. I, I think it has to. One of the OTRP, uh, so Ming helped me out here, but uh, the, one of the discussions that I believe that uh, we had around OTRP was that, say, the uh, query response equivalent that comes back uh, gets encrypted with the TAMS public key such that uh, the information coming out of the TEE can't be decrypted by anybody other than the TAM, right? And that's the type of stuff that we want to use the COSE objects encryption for. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll need to, to add that. Uh, so, I will, so, but this, this at the moment just talks about uh, those sort of basic deep message processing and, and doesn't cover yet the other things that uh, we're just talking about. In a separate PR issue or whatever, I'm just saying that's what yeah, I, I see as the gaps in this be topic here, because this is the section on creating a deep message that I think would have such a discussion. So. Yeah. yeah that, uh, right, mutual, um, well, you could be using mutual um, public key there. I would change that, okay. Uh, this issue done. So, if you guys have some comments on this, I would change, um, take the comments that were previously brought up into account on the, on the signing. Um, always, yeah. yes. Just a small comment. When I look at here, I just noted that I use the word deep with a lowercase e p. Maybe crop out. Do we use all uppercase? Do, do we? Uh, do we always use uppercase? Yeah, and I talk. I believe architect document others. Maybe you said uh, okay. E e e p. I mean, consistently they've all been caps. <laughs> all caps because it's not like the new terminology to us. Keep. Okay, I can. I yeah. Uh, yeah I align that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't pay that. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, next PR. Where was I? <laughs> I lost track of where I was. This is yeah okay. right i noticed uh that's a little bit embarrassing um of course i noticed when working uh, um okay uh so maybe those are not seaboard tags but they um um or keys or uh whatever you want to call them but they they end up um so the protocol so the way the uh, deep protocol messages are currently defined it's it's using a map and um and for each of the keys in the map you have to you have to essentially define a, a number for them on or, or whatever you want um so that it maps to the value and uh so far um that was missing from the document so um it seems that maybe i should maybe the, the term key is the right term um name key and then uh, there's also the data type related to that item. So if you if you can again go to files change, you will see what uh, what I actually mean by this. Uh, the key is is definitely the right term in a CBOR context. Okay. Of course, in the context security context, that can be very confusing. Yeah, it can be confusing. Uh, so, so Cozy, for instance, uses the term label for that. Label. Okay. Mm. Okay. Then I'll change it to label. Um, if you go down, uh, this is uh, another change that I probably should have made, should not have made here, but uh, it's okay. Um, this is the real uh, item. So, for example, you see there's a, a type um, sort of field in the message that we talked about, uh, token, request, etc., cetera, nonce. Um, and then there's, and each of them needs to have um, um, sort of this, this field uh, in this map, and so so we can uh, associate that. And I'm obviously suggesting to add that to the to the document to make the whole specification implementable. Um, I I think I looked at it was the the CWD on what we did there. That's sort of kind of where I copied it. Um, and yeah, all of the fields are there. Really need this tag number. Otherwise, uh, map, Cbor. If we don't use number, it's going to be um, byte string. So the long label name is going to be consume a lot of um, bytes instead of one byte number. So 
yeah, that that was definitely not my intention. Uh, that, I I don't think that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Um. So I'm not the uh, CPOR expert, but um, I thought that, uh, so I'm looking at line 558, the type, isn't that present in every possible message? Why does that have to be inside the map? So, so you can choose uh, whether you want to, whether you use an array um, or you can use a, a map. Of course, you can combine things um, if you want, if, if you think that that's, there's a benefit. And so the way it's currently, written is that the whole thing is a is a map um i this is quite useful when you have um many optional elements in a or if you have uh, many optional elements in a in a message and so that's what i had the question i'm asking is if there are fields that are not optional and like type is the one that jumps out at me then can it be an array with two elements where the first element is the type and the second element is the map of stuff or something like that? I don't know. So I'm, I'm not the C4 expert as what yeah. the most efficient it, coding is, but the point is uh, if type is not optional and will always appear in every possible message, then you don't have to include the label inside the message and you can get more bytes uh, out of it. Um, you, you, you could do that. Um, what, what did that what make I don't sense? What is, is if it increases your code size to, to do parsing which way is better? So, well, to me, it looked easier to just use the map and uh, do it that way. But uh, Akira, you, you've been uh, implementing this as well. So, what's uh, actually uh, Dave? You did you uh, started as well? Uh, I did too. But when I did my implementation at the Berlin Hackathon, I was just using a, an array of fields in a particular sequence because there was no labels, right? And so uh, I was using the I was assuming that everything was in mand was mandatory in the First implementation I was doing because I didn't have enough information on the map, and so I just did an array with no with no labels. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So conventionally, it it's um, it's easier to to uh, in an implementation to uh, take mandatory fields out of an array because in a map they may be anywhere, so somebody so could send the type last. And uh, so you cannot really process anything else of the message uh, before you have seen that uh, type. Uh, mm. I think Dave's approach is uh, uh, actually a good one. Uh, the other observation I have is that uh, the, the content of that table, in particular the third column, uh, really is in this CDDL. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how, how much we win from having it in the table here, but, but I haven't really read the document in detail yet, so that, that comment may be mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I, I took it from, as I said, like from the CWT um, support. That was um, sort of an accepted approach. Yeah, third column, um, I, I agree. It, um, it's, it's good to have the third column information in the CDDL format. But um, right now in the TIP protocol, the the type for the label name is not in the it's not written in the um, CDD uh, uh, message. So that, that's why probably it's in uh, this chart. Should be. So my um. Um, optimized version of the tip message suggestion in the mailing list today is I wrote the type inside a, a tip, tip message a CDD format. Right. Actually, we can. Um, it's probably a good time to switch over to that issue. Um, to just see how that looks like because uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. If you switch over to the um the issues. On the, on the other tab, the the topmost one, twenty one. Yeah, um, Akira, maybe maybe you want to talk about your proposal yourself. I think it looks. Um, I can't yes. get it all in one page, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yes, um, there's no. Um, uh, sentence is just CDDL. 
description here is just my reverse writing from my binary writing my on my notes from from the hackathon so um because from the binary format it's meant to be uh, compact and doesn't have uh, all the information like a label name is disappeared and reversing to the text format and the CD took me a while but um um so one of the changes is I wanted to uh for the implementation per perspective wanted to know each member in the map or array wanted to know what is the type so I wrote I add the type inside of uh, the description and then next thing I wrote was the what if it's going to be the member a label name is not going to be a byte string then I would like to use the uh, number and integer and if it's in most of the message uh the the member is is not going to exceed 255 um, um number so it's one byte should be sufficient so i try to put the number in one byte even for the query message query response a uh, query request query response install and the response uh, re reply is success or error and stuff and and wrote yes so it's it's more like a clarify for the implement implement implementation perspective, and also it will reducing the size by eliminating any of the having unnecessary byte string from the um tip uh, tip tip binary. Of course, the like uh, nouns we discussed earlier going to be byte string from eight byte to sixty four byte. That's going to be byte string, but other than that, yes, try to use regular in integer for which is for the computer. Computer CPU is easier to compare and match. So that's, that's the summary. I, th I think, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kira, for putting that together. I think that's very good, and we should fold that into the uh, specification, like taking modifying the table that we talked about earlier and then um, taking the data types out, putting them in here, I think uh, um, it's more compact. And I also wrote every single type, how much, uh, specifying the size of the uh, type. Yeah, I've seen that, uh, I like that too. Uh, so, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, um, I think we can see that. Yeah. So, for example, here, the uh, the type um, is a uint uh, size one. I think that's good. Um, we talked the talked about the token already, and and the non. Um, you copy that over from uh, what we talked on the mailing list about the eat uh, stuff and so on. So, I think um, to me that this looks very good. And with on, on, and after this, without going to hit the nouns a binary string, it's it's uh, before it, if we don't if before the encryption or signing, then the, it's less than thirty two byte or forty less than forty bytes. So yeah. before the JSON, it was it was um, sometimes was more than fifteen hundred. Okay, um, uh, that issue done. Um, I think we can, we should then uh, look at some of the other issues and uh, obviously lots of them. Dave, um, uh, who is MCD 500? Who is that? that that's me. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, do, do you want to talk about, uh, um, select something from there as well since you filed a couple of issues? I don't remember what, what I filed. Um, I remember the two that I filed. Uh, well, maybe we start with those then. Uh, okay, go to number two then, the very bottom one. So, uh, Which one? The TAM? Requested, requested components. Requested components. Requested components. requested components. 
So this one came up at the uh, Berlin Hackathon uh, because we had previously added this into the OTRP spec, but had not been added into the T protocol spec. And so uh, the T architecture talks about passing the list of uh, requested TAs. So you have, say, an installer program that says, I would like to install uh, or I have a dependency on the following TA. And so uh, the TAM may have a whole bunch of you know authorized ones, but whether something needs to be installed or not may depend on whether there's some dependency on it. So it might have you know 100 that would be okay, but it only wants to take the uh, space of installing the ones that are actually needed. And so this would be a way of, of passing uh, the set of things that are, are potentially needed and the TAM can decide whether it's authorized. And so that's what's going on here in the architecture document. But um, in the uh, query response that comes back from the device, there was no field for passing in the set of requested TAs, only the set of ones that are already installed. And so, as I mentioned, we'd added it into OTRP. And so this is to say we need the same thing in the uh, TEAP protocol. So another field in the list of uh, you know, TAs, just like you have a list of TAs installed, we need another thing in there to add the list of TAs desired. Here, there's not a specific proposal to edit in, but that would go into that same CDDL that we were just looking at next to where the list of installed TAs would be as another field. So, uh, Dave, are you saying, like, would that go into the um, trusted app install message and saying, okay? Um, no, 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 this is in the query response. So, this would be in the yeah. query response. In a query CDDL uh, that we just. Um, yeah. Uh, we're looking at right there was like the query request and so on. So this is, okay. yeah. you know, the, the TAM says, hey, please, TEEP agent, please give me your state. So the TEEP agent gives it back. Oh, and by the way, here's my state. Here's the TAs I've installed. And then here's a TA, it's a list of TAs that I don't have installed that I have dependencies on that things would use them if you would install them. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We don't have that. Yeah. Correct. And so this is just noting that we need to add that in for consistency with what we did in OTRP. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't there in initial in OTRP either. Like, I don't think it's in there in the global platform version, but we did put it in uh, based on the discussions that Ming and I had had at previous hackathons and so on. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's what that one is. All right. Cool. And go on to the other one then, unless there's any other comments on that one. And then, so you go into the now caching. Yeah, that's the one. This is the one that I mentioned that we filed um, from the uh, transport spec to say. Uh, the transport had this change, um, but the T uh, spec, the T protocol itself is missing the same discussion. So this is to say that um, uh, the T agent can cache, you know, the OCSP data such that, so this is the protocol changes. You have to allow for the case that you can send a query response without having received the initial query request, right? So in other words, pretend that you got a query request with all the bits set for things that you might want, and you can just go ahead and send that query response in the very first message. Okay, it doesn't allow for that right now in the T protocol spec, and that's what we did in OTRP is to allow for that, which gets rid of an extra round trip. If you already have a cache, right? So the very first time, if you have a cold cache or that your the TAM certificate is expired or whatever else, then or you flushed your cache, then of course you can just reach out and do the normal thing and connect, wait for it to send you the query request. Then you've got the uh, TAM certificate you can encrypt your secure your uh, query response with, right? But if you can cache the thing, that you don't have to wait for that certificate. Right. This is related to that uh, TIP agent initiated call, right? So we'll exactly. the yep. discussion was that can we avoid to contact time first? Exactly. So TIP agent local, but uh, so we, we don't want to send data if we don't know time we can trust. How do you know that? So that more for future run trip. If you already have that one, then local uh, local install or whatever, call TIP broker to TIP agent can okay? initiate from there. So what do you want to run trip? Yep, exactly. So I think we, at least Ming and I, know what needs to be said in the document, and this is just a track that we need to write that text and put it in for consistency with what we wanted. Sounds cool. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything else we have to discuss on that one. So that's the end of the two issues that I filed. Are you are you going to create two BRs to add um, one for this and uh, one for the other topic that we talked about? Yep, that's my plan. Cool. Thanks. Akira, um, do you want to discuss one of your issues? 
Yes, one 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 is very easy one. From the second one, from the bottom, the T ID, the T device has to match or member. This is, I think, it's already re, uh, resolved. Um, this is was also, I think, it was discussed in OTRP when matching um, 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 from sending the TA ID from the TAM to the device, or or uh, there will be vendor ID and class ID and device ID, and I think this was end up only having. Some byte string it only with will be called div, um, TA ID and not with all this uh, vendor ID, class ID, and the device ID. I think this will be in the soup the manifest, but um, in the tape protocol, I think it was end up having discussion some some in some um, some hackathon or I did in the path. Yet yeah, um. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think we talked about this at the Berlin Hackathon, and and I think you're right to carry that this was already uh, resolved as the, as what should be done. I don't know if the current draft does it, but I think it was all agreement at the Berlin Hackathon as to what the answer was. Yeah, I, th I think we uh, back then we said that the device ID would indeed be something that we um, we don't necessarily need. The class ID is something we talked about this in the context of the OptiE, which uses the UID. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking, Akira, because you did the hackathon report at the uh, February interim from that meeting, and I thought that you actually had a slide on this that we talked about in the February interim as your hackathon report. Uh, or, or I did or something, I don't remember, but I know it was in that time frame that, that was the February interim. And I think um, that time we end up using some, something 16 byte ring. Uh, the UID or or um, the DLL name or right. We said we wanted to match exactly what uh, OTRP already had, and that one had that TAID, and we said we were just going to match uh, what was in the OTRP spec. File names for me seems seems to be very reasonable. The file name. Um, I think we have to look at what the existing um. Operating systems in in the DEs actually do, and um, I have to. Ah, okay, check now, now I'm starting to refresh my memory. The as I recall the discussion, and this is from memory, but you've not had enough keywords. I remember um, that there was a unique identifier that was outside of the suit manifest, um, and like a TAID, which could be a UUID or whatever it was. It just had to be some unique identifier, not three of them, like not vendor class device, but just one one thing that was unique. And then all the other details, like where to put it and so on, that's whatever is in the suit manifest because suit had already solved that. Like file name or discussion, that all that is part of suit manifest, not something that we deal with in T. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we still need to sort of um, look at how we map um, this appropriately because, uh, for example, if the suit manifest says it depends on another DA, um, then that information needs to be in the manifest itself. Wouldn't it be? Yes, because that was, if you remember a while back, we had a uh, list of TEEP requirements on suit that uh, the TEEP working group prepared and that I presented over into suit on behalf of the TEEP working group. And the suit working group went through them and Brandon said, yep, already done. Yep, already there. Yep, already there. We'll add that. We'll add that. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, um, and maybe, uh, if they had been added yet, I'd have to check, but the point was that Brendan and the suit working group in general agreed that, yep, we will accommodate teach requirements for those. Yeah, I think we need to double check and um, put some text into, uh, but I don't think I've addressed this issue yet in the in a current the protocol draft, so we need to double check that as well. I don't think it's in the draft yet, yes. Yeah, so we have to do that. Yeah. yeah this this looks need more discussion. Like a link back to suit, right? How to identify TA when we upgrade it, right? We identify that when we have new version coming and say identify by the ID unique that should be fine. Or by the name. The name is not unique, but it may, may not be unique. So we have not define that.
Should we go to another another uh, pull request? Another issue. We've got five and a half minutes left. Or maybe maybe you um, maybe we should instead do some planning <laughs> for the next. Yeah, well, so the next call is tomorrow, so we can continue tomorrow. I didn't cancel it just in case. Um, so we can continue the, the discussion of these comments tomorrow, or you could do it over the list and we could set up another virtual interim, you know, at some later point in time. It's up to the group. And you, I think the question is whether there's any issues on here that need direction from the working group for coming up with a proposal on how to address. Because the proposal is would be a pull request, right? Is there anything that would need direction before somebody could come up with a pull request? Admittedly, have not looked at these comments, so. I'm mostly asking Akira because most of them are his. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, one is the install delete wish from sending a delete install delete wish from the client app to the tab. I agree. That's a good one for us to discuss. That would be worth at least two minutes on now. Yes. Which one is that? Oh, this one. Third one. Third one from the top. This one. Yes. So, uh, currently in the. Uh, message from query response from the device to the tab does not have a member to say client Apple is expecting to have to send uh, have the um, send uh, initiate install or delete. So, but sometimes device have a client app installed by the vendor or pre-installed or they it's client app installed by other store. Uh, um, whatever it's called and it wants to have the particular TA bind it to the client app to yes to be have distribute from the um, associated um, tab. so and, and yes so this one the 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 list of things that would be in the um, install wish is the same as the issue that I talked about um, what's different here is this notion of can you can, can the TEEP agent pass a list of TAs for which you would like to delete? That's what's new in this issue beyond what was in the other issue. And that's not something the working group has ever discussed, even in the OTRP context, is should we actually allow the TEEP agent to pass a things for which it no longer has a dependency? Maybe you've now deleted the rich apps that would used to depend on it. And so that's now just kind of hanging out there with with um, nothing that depends on it, it's just consuming space and it might like to reclaim space and passing that knowledge from the TEEP agent to the TAM would allow the TAM to say, okay, if there's no dependencies, then I'm okay with going ahead and pushing a delete message on that one. And so that's new and that's why I said it would be useful to bring this up because we've never discussed this. Uh, but personally, I think this, this is a good idea, so. Anybody thinks it's not a good idea because otherwise, um, since I was going to do a pull request on how to pass a list of requested stuff and Akira has a little CDL snippet, then at least between Akira and I, I think we have enough information to generate a pull request. But since we've never talked about the reason to do this, I just wanted to take a second to elaborate that on the list here on the on the call here. Yeah, I think I think it would be um, to think a little bit more. I think it would be nice to have more context on about the use about the use case that you have in mind because like for example i'm i'm having a hard time seeing on how just another um field with a unsigned integer provides you that information it, it doesn't what you need is the, you need the list of ta ids and so in the other issue that exactly. i talked about wild, it's here's the list of ta ids that i would like to install that i have dependencies on but they're not installed right now i i being the t agent right mm. and so yeah. you're suggesting we might want the same thing of here's out of my I say, here's a list of TAs that are installed that I have, right? Well, here's a list of the TAs that are installed that I no longer have dependencies on, so it would be okay to remove them if you want, right? And so he's saying we should actually have a field in there which is a different list, or maybe it's another way of encoding the same list. And so okay. unless anybody objects, then Akira and I, we can go ahead and come up with a pull request that does that. But we just wanted to 
surface this uh, notion that Akira came up with, which I said, I, I agree that this is a good idea. So. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then I think we're just about at time. So unless there's anything else you want to say, Akira, that's why I said it was a good idea. Uh, I'm fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as Dave said, we're, we are just about out of time. So the question for the group is, do you believe we need to meet tomorrow? I don't think so. I think we need to um, work on the items and we, we could schedule another call in, let's say, a month from now and see um, what the status is and how we made progress with the implementations as well. Okay. I agree. I don't see a reason to meet tomorrow. Okay. So I'll send out a cancellation and then um, maybe I'll put a, a question to the group. Um, Maybe have the meeting five weeks out, something like that. Sounds good. Um, I think it partly depends on if you're going to start a working group last call on one of the documents or a second working group last call, then when would that complete? And so we should line that up with that timeline. So if you don't decide right now, you might want to decide like shortly thereafter or close yeah, to let me Let me decide that based on, on the working group last calls. Well, on the results, so we're kind of gated on on Thierry and a couple of other items. So, but in the interest of time, um, I will cancel tomorrow's call, and then we'll set up another interim whenever we think is is about the right window. But um, for the architecture document, um, I think the decision today was to start the second working group last call at uh, like any time now, like today it was. So correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's just the one on the transport. We said uh, what the timeline. Anyway, I'll leave that to the chairs to figure out. So, yeah, and that one we're gated. Okay, so um, Terry and I will get together. We'll send out the email for the action items. I think just to make it all clear. Um, but the thing that is clear, there's no call tomorrow. That one I'll I'll try and send out right away. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. With that, thank you, everyone. Um, last last mention for those who didn't, please put your names if you haven't already on the virtual blue sheets, which is at the bottom of the ether pad. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.